from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Carolyn Brown, Director of the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you here for a lecture by uh, Professor David Layton with a most provocative title, One Muslim is Enough, Evidence from a Field Experiment in France. Um, before we begin, if you would please turn off any cell phones and uh, other um, electronic uh, equipment that may beep and bonk or interfere with the electronics. Um, this event is being sponsored by the Kluge Center. Uh, the center was established through the generous donation of John W. Kluge uh, in the year 2000, um, and it brings to the library uh, some of the world's most accomplished senior scholars um, and most promising rising junior scholars. Uh, center also promotes um, intellectual life at the library through lectures like such as this one, small symposia, uh, conferences. Um, you're invited to, um, those of you who don't know that much about the center, to go to the library's webpage, front page over on the Right side, you have to scroll down a little bit till you get to the Kluge Center, and at the bottom of the Kluge Center page, you can sign up for uh, notification of our events. Um, over the last uh, several years, it's become uh, increasingly apparent, um, certainly to me, I'm sure to you as well, that the presence of Muslims in Europe has challenged Europeans to wrestle in new ways with issues of European identity and how Muslims might be incorporated into that definition of self. Uh, from time to time, the issue flares up on our television screens. I'm sure you've all encountered this, um, but we rarely have the opportunity to listen to a scholar who has studied um, some of these issues in depth and also thought deeply about them. So we are privileged today, uh, and I don't mean that loosely. We really are privileged to have um, David Layton, who will focus on a central feature of this complex issue, that is the feature of religious discrimination. Dr. Layton currently holds the Kluge Chair in Countries and Cultures of the North. He's been with us for almost three months. Um, and at his time in the Kluge Center, he's been analyzing the data he has collected over the past several years on social and economic integration of Muslims into contemporary France. Um, working with two colleagues, uh, Claire L. Adida from the University of California at San Diego and Marie-Anne Valfort of the Sorbonne, Leighton has examined the causes of religious discrimination in France, especially by French Christians against Muslims. In his lecture, Leighton will look at the mechanisms that sustain discrimination. He will discuss why he and his co-researchers um, have concluded that while the discrimination flows through a non-rational channel, it is in fact rational for employers to condition their employment decisions on this convention and thereby to discriminate against Muslims in the French labor market. Um, that's sort of a, well, it'll be very interesting to hear how all of this has been worked out and discovered. And when Dr. Layton isn't at the Kluge Center, um, he is the James T. Watkins Fourth and Elias V. Watkins Professor of Political Science in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. He has published extensively on ethnic cooperation and conflict, religion-based discrimination, and the organizational sources of suicide terrorism. He is the author of innumerable articles, six books. Um, included among these are Nation States and Violence, uh, that was 2007. Identity and Formation, the Russian-speaking populations of the near abroad, and language repertoires and state construction in Africa. Uh, Dr. Layton is a graduate of Swarthmore College and learned, earned his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. He is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Sciences Po 
à Paris, um, and has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. Um, in short, by uh, experience, scholarship, and I might even add temperament, um, he's extremely well situated to um, enlighten us some on the issue of religious discrimination against Muslims in France. So please welcome David Layton. Thank you, Carolyn, for that wonderful introduction, warm introduction, and uh, to the Kluge Center for housing not only me, but uh, Marianne Valfour as well uh, uh, during a period of collaboration on this project. So integration of Muslims in French society, this uh, picture from uh, Marseille captures all the contradictions, or at least many of the contradictions, that those of us who walk through the streets of Europe know this all the time, that even the woman uh, uh, wearing hijab uh, is also carrying a bag suggesting she's one of the more stylish young women in, um, in Marseille. Uh, so two questions motivate this research. The first is, do Muslim immigrants face greater barriers to social and economic advance in France than if everything were about them were the same, but they weren't Muslims? That is, can you actually measure the marginal effect of being Muslim from other characteristics that many Muslims in France also um, uh, have, uh, for instance, being from North Africa? Uh, and how do you separate out an additional Muslim effect and measure it? And if you do find that they face greater barriers, the second question is, why? Most of my talk today will be on the second question. The motivation of this topic, as Carolyn mentioned, um, uh, is almost uh, uh, obvious and need not be said. Uh, uh, integration of Muslims or uh, attempted integration or non-integration of Muslims in um, uh, in uh, uh, European society is about the most politically sensitive issue uh, in Europe today. Uh, you can't go for a day, as I'll try to make clear in this slide, you can't go th for a day without the issue coming up somewhere in some, uh, in some polemical form. Uh, there was the, the, they come in France, they come out as a string of affaires, uh, and um, these affaires mean uh, 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 that uh, uh, everybody is talking about it. It seems like a national crisis. Whether s girls wearing the foulard uh, can come to school, a headscarf can come to school uh, with the, wearing the foulard, that took about two or three years of intense debate within France. Uh, the, whether, in fact, um, in large uh, uh, public housing uh, establishments, uh, Muslims can get access to halal meat, uh, whether they can actually do the slaughtering of the animals in urban um, apartments, uh, takes the newspapers and, um, and the press uh, uh, continuously uh, debating this issue. Uh, when I was last there, uh, the McDonald's of France called Quick uh, uh, started serving only halal meats in a few uh, all-Muslim neighborhoods in southern France, and this caused a national uproar that French people did not have a choice between halal and non-halal meats if they went to a particular quick store. How could French people not have access to non-halal meats in any quick store in the country? Prayer rooms, street prayers, and mosques uh, issues uh, uh, even make the New York Times uh, uh, and front pages in all the uh, the, the French press. Uh, the issue of uh, Turkey and the European Union uh, under Jacques Chirac, it was sort of unsaid and un not need to be said because it pervaded the left and the right in France that we should make believe we want Turkey in, in the European Union and do everything we can to subvert it. Uh, and this too brings uh, immense discussion uh, throughout Europe. And it's amazing how much uh, this issue is a subject of polemics rather than careful research. Uh, Tilo Sarazin's book, I think it's called uh, uh, Germany Abolishes Itself, uh, uh, was a bestseller for months in the, uh, in the Ger German uh, 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 lists this fall, which essentially said we're being over, us Teutons are being overrun by uh, Turks and Muslims and we're, uh, we're uh, undermining our very culture. Christopher Caldwell uh, uh, 
an excellent journalist for the Financial Times, wrote a book uh, essentially arguing that there's a thing called Team Islam, which is vigorous, which is active, and which one day will transform Europe from its own cultural moorings uh, and subvert everything Europeans have stood for. Uh, in France, uh, you can't uh, uh, go a day without a, uh, without a message coming from this organization, Repost Laïque, uh, that, uh, uh, that tries to defend French uh, secularism uh, coming from 1905 uh, laws uh, uh, promoting laïcité, essentially uh, 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 separating uh, French people from their nuns in school, uh, keeping uh, priests out of uh, the, uh, the, the public dole. Uh, and this has become consecrated in France, this laïcité, uh, as a fundamental aspect of French republicanism. So just from two days ago from uh, Repost Laïque, uh, we see a posting of the following. Francois, Francois Fillon, the prime minister, uh, finally, after a great deal of uh, uh, discussion about street prayers, because there's not enough mosques in uh, major cities, uh, Muslims on Friday afternoon uh, pretty much take up two or three blocks on the street uh, to pray. And uh, this is a, a problem that French people don't like, actually, to walk through town and not be able to get through it because of Muslim prayer. Uh, but there are no mosques large enough, and they can't get zoning rights uh, to build in many towns. Uh, they also can't bring up their own imams, their own uh, prayer leaders, because there's no schools for imams, hardly any in France, and they import them from Saudi Arabia or Yemen, uh, uh, which pretty much brings in uh, uh, radicals that the French are unhappy with. So Francois Fillon uh, proposed uh, some educational um, uh, support for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the formation of imams and also for the, product and for the building of mosques. Uh, in a political program, he said, uh, to adapt uh, French laïcité to a new situation. Adapter laïcité française à une situation nouvelle. Well, what did Repost uh, Laïque say about this? You can see the quote if you read French. It's a grave treason uh, of, the, of the French and of France, of our history, of our civilization, of our humanist and Republican values. This is the language of the everyday polemics uh, in France and through the rest of Europe uh, in the way they treat issues of accommodation to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to what uh, Francois Fillon called uh, a nouvelle situation, a new situation. So why polemics and anecdotes reign? There are reasons why there's more polemics than there is analysis. First, in French republicanism, going back to French republicanism, you're not allowed, or the state is not allowed to collect data on people's religion. So uh, if you look at estimates of the Muslim population in France, it goes from anywhere from 3 million to 8 million, and no one knows. Uh, and no one really knows what Muslims really think about wanting to become French, because you can't ask people if they're Muslim, at least from state statistics. So in other words, uh, given the constraints that no state funding will permit questions about people's religion, it's very hard to know, <laughs> uh, very hard to know whether Muslims are doing better than they would otherwise do if they weren't Muslim, if you can't detect who is a Muslim. There's also a question, as I intimated earlier, of confounds in cross-national data sets. So, to understand where the confound is, uh, statistically, uh, if you want to know whether the Muslims are doing better or worse in France than non-Muslims, 95% of the Muslims uh, are from North Africa. So if you make a statistical equation, sorry, I'm going to go back to you, and put on what's called the dependent variable left-hand side the economic advance, and then the right-hand side, Muslim or non-Muslim, you can find out that Muslims do far worse. But then if you add another variable on the right-hand side, the independent variable side called country of origin, since the two country of origin, mostly Algeria and Morocco, uh, and religion are, uh, are collinear, that the, the statistical models won't allow you to, t won't allow you to uh, get a clear answer of whether mu the Muslimness is doing the work or the North Africanness is doing the work. Similarly, if you do this in Germany, if you put Turk or Turkish origin uh, on the right-hand side of the statistical model, 
you won't know if it's Turkish origin or Muslim that's, that's doing the work. Similarly in UK uh, with South Asian. So given the problems that most of the, for each of the countries, most of the Muslim immigrants come from one region or one section of the, uh, or one country, uh, it's very hard to know uh, whether, back to France, whether it is the memories of the Algerian war which is driving, and therefore North Africans or Algerians, which is driving the result, or the Muslimness. Uh, so th this is called statistical confounds. So, in response to this, many uh, anthropologists, and excellent anthropologists, go into the bidonville, the, uh, the uh, suburbs or the ghettos. It's, uh, bidonville is better said as the ghettos of, uh, of the immigrant populations. When most of the immigrants came in in the early 1970s, uh, France still thought that its industrial infrastructure was going to have more and more need for workers. And they built gigantic uh, housing estates, encouraged immigrants to come just before the manufacturing um, uh, boom collapsed. And so these places with highly subsidized housing and no jobs are places of, of great despair, especially for second generation kids brought up in this with no hope for jobs, um, no place to go. Um, and, uh, and what do anthropologists find? That A, they're mostly Muslim, and B, they're living in a terrible situation. But is this because they're Muslim? Or is it because <laughs> they, it's mostly Muslims who came in the 70s and they're all in, these, in this terrible situation of the immigrants of the 1970s? And worse than that, if you just study the bidonville, that's like going to East Los Angeles today and, and concluding that no one, is, no one is learning English. I've read many papers of this. Uh, the Hispanic population doesn't want to learn English, just have to go to East Los Angeles and everyone speaks Spanish. They don't look at the ones who've moved out of East Los Angeles after getting good jobs. The people who study the bidonville are not looking at the percentage of people who are able to move out living in the first or second arrondissement in Paris, you know, and living well. Uh, so, so if you only look at the losers, you don't know the probability of being a winner. So the anthropological studies have not been successful in knowing how well the Muslims are doing compared to other groups. So I went to the National Science Foundation with an idea of how to address both selection issues uh, of the anthropologists and the confound issues of the economists. He said there were two groups from southwestern Senegal. Um, and in southwestern Senegal, near the Casamans, uh, there are two linguistic or language communities uh, that were s for which the Islamic Jihad took much longer to reach, being far to the west and to the south, and in which Christian missionaries came more or less the same time as Islamic Jihadists. And in these two communities, the Jolas and Seras, spelled over there, uh, uh, they're about 35% Christians and 65% Muslims. We know from Senegalese census data that the Christians and Muslims have about the same levels of education. Their parents uh, obviously speak the same languages. They, they, they engage in the same cultural rituals. Um, and the, the parents have more or less the same uh, occupational status. And more or less in the early 1970s, young people, uh, in their uh, high teens or young 20s, came to France in the situations I told you about, of no opportunities in Senegal and this great opportunities in France. And 33% of them were Christians and 65% Muslims. And from 1974, now we have one and a half generations of these Sarajola uh, uh, migrants and their children into France. And this project was to trace these two groups for a generation and a half and to ask the question, would Muslims do better or worse in France than the Christians controlling for everything else? Controlling for language, controlling for country of origin, controlling for uh, uh, the fact that they're, uh, uh, they're Africans or uh, uh, they're uh, uh, racially Africans. So everything about them was the same, but their religion. Would there be any difference in their success in France? So that was uh, what I went to NSF with. Uh, I then suggested a variety of techniques to, to study these 
uh, two groups or these two subgroups um, uh, through, an, through an ethnography, interviewing and re-interviewing about 40 families, 20 Christian and 20 Muslims, doing a survey of about 500 uh, Sarah and Jola, uh, uh, second generation, uh, that is French citizen Sarah and Jola, and then a bunch of experiments, most of which, uh, uh, one of which I'm going to spend a good deal of time today talking about. The answer to the first question, for which I'll spend a few minutes just to give you the background or else the second question has no meaning. We used a CV experiment and a survey instrument to establish a clear answer. There are higher barriers to economic integration for Muslims, who I will now call SMs, Senegalese Muslims, compared to a matched set of Christians, who I will now call SXs, Senegalese Christians. Uh, so um, those are my two acronyms. There'll be one more acronym you'll have to remember. Uh, uh, but always when I say SMs do worse, I mean SMs do worse compared to a matched set of SXs. So we're not comparing SMs to Polish immigrants or to Lithuanian immigrants or to Kosovo immigrants, but to a match set of Senegalese Christian immigrants. So the first experiment we, uh, we did was a, a CV experiment. We created three CVs. One, both two of them with uh, obvious Senegalese surnames, Djof. One of them was Khadija Djof. The other one was Marie Djof. One suggesting um, a, a Senegalese with a Christian uh, first name and one a Senegalese with a Muslim first name. And then we created a Republican uh, um, uh, CV because we couldn't send to the same firm uh, an application for a Khadija Diof and a Marie Diof with exactly the same qualifications. It would be known, seen as a trick. So we created a third person, Aurelie Menard. Uh, and she had exactly the same qualifications as our two Djofs, uh, uh, lived in the same kind of zip code in the, in the city in which um, uh, the employment advertisement uh, was, uh, was uh, uh, developed. Um, and, uh, and there were two other small differences between the Khadija Djof and Marie Djof, uh, giving a signal that one was a Muslim uh, uh, and one was, uh, was a Christian. Uh, so we made clear to the HR folk, the human relations folk, uh, that uh, one was a Christian and one was a Muslim. And over here we can see, if I can press this, ah, back. Over here we can see on the left-hand side, I guess I have to describe it to you, on the left-hand bar graph, we're comparing Marie Dioff and Aurelie Menard on the, on the y-axis up and down is the probability of getting a call back, that is, an interview, an interview request. And on the left-hand side is Marie Dioff versus Aurelie uh, Menard. And you can see Aurelie Menard did better than Marie Dioff, uh, but it turns out not statistically significantly better, but better. On the right-hand side, we see Aurelie Menard versus Khadija Dioff. And there we see that, uh, that uh, uh, that Marie Dioff did two and a half times better in getting callbacks than Khadija with the exact same qualifications. The only difference is being one uh, was a Muslim and the other was a non-Muslim, everything else the same. Halfway through this, the people who were running the experiment for me uh, called me up and said, the results are too clear. No one gets results this, this clear. Maybe they don't know that Dioff is a Senegalese name. Maybe they think Marie Dioff is French, which I said, that's absurd. And they said, we agree it's absurd. And then we agreed that we would put a picture of an African woman on both Marie and Khadija's CV. It's never done in France, but we did it for both. And the results were exactly the same. So they knew it was an African woman, Marie Dioff, uh, and still, uh, you could say one positive thing about this is that the French don't appear to be as racist as Americans. Uh, 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 th there was no statistical difference based upon race. Uh, and on the right-hand side, I'm not doing this very well. On the right-hand side uh, is what we call a bar graph. Those two lines 
uh, on the left and right with a dot in the center, those two lines are called the 95% confidence interval, which is basically saying uh, uh, that the statistical model will only give you assurance uh, within, that, within that range. And we see for hourly Menard versus Marie Dioff on the top uh, that it, it crosses zero, which means we cannot rule out there's no effect. Whereas in the bottom one, it doesn't cross zero. We can be statistically certain that, uh, that Marie Dioff did, uh, sorry, Khadija Dioff did far worse than hourly Menard. Uh, so it's a clear uh, demonstration of religious discrimination. And then what we did from the 511 person survey of second generation uh, 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 Sarah and Jola uh, immigrants, uh, we ran a survey, survey done both FASA FASA face to face and half by telephone. Uh, as I said, there was one third uh, Christians and two thirds Muslims. We asked them a whole range of questions. Uh, but uh, the important one for, for this talk is we found out what their household income was. And what we found was that the best predictor, the best predictor of household income of our 511 is if you knew the question whether they were Christians or Muslims. We, we looked at uh, whether the head of household was a male. That's significant, more likely to be uh, higher income. We looked to see if the, uh, the head of household's uh, education on that level, and that turned out to be significant. We looked at education of the first migrant uh, of the family to France. That turned out to be non-significant. But that dot in the very first, very first row uh, of Christian household suggests that the, that the most significant effect of all the variables is um, uh, is uh, whether they're Christians or Muslims. And to put it in very simple terms, that dot, at that point of the dot, what that's telling us is that, that if, if the household is a Christian household, it's earning, on average, 400 euros a month more than if everything, were about, the, everything were about the household were like, but it was Muslim. And that's about 15% of average French income. So we're talking about an extremely large uh, result here uh, of Muslims' families earning far less than a matched set of Christian families. This is consistent with the data uh, on, uh, on job discrimination. But since the, uh, since the two interventions were, were distinct, we can't really make a causal statement about it. But the two are consistent with, uh, with high levels of job discrimination with very, very large income differentials in the French labor market. And we then have to search for explanations. And that's what this paper, even though it's taken me 20 minutes to get here, um, this is what this paper is about. What, uh, what explains the observed uh, discrimination and the search for mechanisms? And that's what I've been here in the Kugi Center working on for the past few months. One of, the, uh, one of the possibilities is what's called, what might be called in-group mechanisms uh, that we know from a great deal of work in economics uh, that the degree to which uh, women, uh, are, women can get educated and into the job market, it brings everyone or all Muslims, or all people of that group, uh, richer. It makes the country richer, the extent to which women enter uh, the educational and labor markets. And so it could be that Muslims are in part holding their women back from advance in the labor market, and it's a gender issue uh, that's driving these results. We have preliminary evidence supporting this, but I'm not reporting on this today. What I'm reporting on is outgroup actions, that is, of people we now will call Francais de Souche. Uh, or rooted French people, uh, people we define, we define very clearly, people whose four grandparents were born within the hexagon. And if your four parents were born within the hexagon, we call you rooted French. And we uh, abbreviate that or acronym for that as FDS. And we're going to look at FDS actions towards SM, Senegalese Muslims in SX, uh, and to see whether it is the Francais de Souche uh, who have some role uh, in the way they think, the way they feel about Muslims that's driving this result. And uh, part, of the, part of the 
enterprise is to say, well, is this a matter, and if, if it is a FDS uh, uh, discrimination, is it because they have beliefs about the way Muslims will act, and therefore, uh, because of those beliefs, be reluctant to hire them? Or is it because, as Gary Becker has said, so if you're rich enough, you can buy, you, in a sense, you can have tastes to say, I would rather lose a certain amount of uh, money from my enterprise uh, by not having to look at Muslims every day. So you might want to pay a uh, cost that is loss in qualified labor by limiting your access to the labor market because of some taste. Uh, and as Gary Becker has said, there's no accounting for taste, but people are willing to spend a lot of money or lose a lot of money uh, to follow their tastes. Is it a matter of taste or is it a matter of beliefs? And that's one of the things we want to examine. So I'm going to explain some experiments to you that help us sort these issues out, uh, the treatment for outgroup behavior. So we have an experimental group. We do this, as I will explain, in France's 19th arrondissement. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Entre les Murs. Uh, in, in English, it's called The Class. Anyone know that movie? Uh, uh, this takes place in the 19th arrondissement, which is, uh, you wouldn't know what country you were in. It looks like the United Nations. Uh, and we ran this experiment in the 19th arrondissement so no one would have any idea uh, that we were doing something about, uh, about Senegalese, about Africans, about religion, because the groups that we brought into this experimental environment looked exactly the way people out in the, in the street looked. Uh, and we asked for the treatment and the group, what we call the group salience effect. Does FDS behavior towards Senegalese Muslims change when there are more Muslims around them? Or salience of SMs. The F, the, the, do FDS change their behavior when they start feeling that there are more Muslims around them? And secondly, does SM behavior toward FDS change when there are more of them around? They become more aggressive or something like that. Is there some effect of the numbers of Muslims in the environment that's driving FDS behavior or SM behavior? Compared, of course, always to SX. This outgroup salience we found in our work was so powerful, we named it after the just deposed Minister of Interior, deposed just two days ago, Brice Ortefeuille. And we therefore call it, and we hope we will make him famous for this, uh, the Ortefeuille effect. What precisely is this effect? Those of you who speak French will get this. It's been downloaded about a million times in France, uh, but I will explain it to you. Well, I'll explain this. <laughs> so, at this summer convention uh, where the party is, uh, or the political party is organizing, uh, an Arab student comes up to the Minister of Interior. And his host has him, the student, make some claims and discussion about politics. And the discussion between them is completely rational, like any uh, you know, student making a claim about French politics. And the host says to the minister, don't you see you're trying to throw Arabs? Uh, Ortefeu had committed to uh, expelling 25, 30,000 uh, uh, Arabs a year out of the country. Why do you want to expel them? These guys, look at him. He's perfectly fine. Uh, and Ortefeu says, he doesn't correspond at all to the prototype. <laughs> and the next line was, when there's one, that's OK. 
It's when there are a lot of them, then there are problems. And for this, we call the Ortefeuille effect. And our principal finding supports this Ortefeuille effect, relying on the treatment that is increasing the salience of Muslims in the group. FDS act in a more anti-generous manner to Muslims as the Muslim salience increases compared to Christians. The second finding, the rather big finding, is that FDS expect other FDS to do similarly. They just assume that other FDS would do the same, which I think that our data will support. Our interpretation of these two findings is that the, that the discrimination is sustained by a French cultural convention as revealed in the matter-of-fact expression by the then French Minister of Interior. He's now apologized a thousand times for these remarks, but you could see from the relaxed atmosphere uh, that he thought this was natural and non-controversial, uh, uh, an understanding of what the Arab prototype is and what happens when there's more than one of them. So I told you about the field site in the highly diverse 19th arrondissement with SM, SX, and FDS. The recruitment of our groups was random. We therefore uh, uh, sent recruiters, including me, to each of the uh, metro stations in the 19th arrondissement. We were under some rule that said we'd pick out of a hat the nth person we, that comes out of the metro station, we have to solicit whether they want to be part of the experiment. And we, we, we got enough uh, people to agree uh, uh, for us to run eight experimental sessions, each with 10, uh, with 10 subjects. And they were always recruited at least two or three, sometimes four in each group, of people who were FDS. And we had to cheat on our random method to get enough FDS, given the nature of the 19th arrondissement. Uh, we had to look for people who looked like FDS. Uh, and even if it wasn't a correct number, we would go to them. And we would put into each group, recruited from elsewhere, people who thought they were just going to play games to earn money, our Senegalese targets, that is, the Seneg SMs and SXs, to see how FDS and others played games with money involved with, uh, with FDS and SX and to see whether they treated FDS, SX and SM differently. So that's what we basically did. There were 10 players in each session. We played two games. We played a whole bunch of games, but I'm going to report on two of them today. One of them, the dictator game, to measure generosity. And the other, we call strategic dictator to get out the PC element, uh, the political correctness uh, element from the dictator game, uh, to measure how, how FDS think other FDS, uh, uh, how generous other FDS would be to Muslims versus Christians. We call that strategic dictator. I'll explain these in a minute. So I'll give you the details. I don't think you're going to be able to read them from the screen. We basically told all recruits that these games are about how residents of Ile de France think about money. And we told them that these games have been played everywhere in the world, but never had been played in France. And we don't have any data on France, and we would like to get them. Uh, and so this is an experiment uh, that, for which you can earn up to 250 euros. That is, if you're Americans, of your taxpayer money. Um, each Others, each person who came in of this group of 10 for each session, a session lasted about two and a half hours, was asked to put her or his name on a label. So they were able to call each other, uh, not A3 or B1, uh, the, the numbers we gave them to keep their anonymity, but uh, something more personal. Um, and there is a confound between Islam and foreign names, uh, which if we were in an econometrics uh, talk, people would start bugging me about because all the Christians had names that the French recognized, all the Muslims had names that the French wouldn't recognize, although only half of them were Muslim names. Before they played the dictator game, which I'm going to describe to you, we played something that you would recognize as speed dating. We called it speed chatting. And they met five of the other people in the room for a four-minute session, and they were told to learn as much as they could about this other person. 
and we paid them one euro for every correct answer in an eight-question eight form. Uh, and, and one of the questions was, what's the religion of this person? And what's interesting is that the FDS often got the answer wrong about the Senegalese. They, it was a very noisy signal of whether the Senegalese were, uh, were recognized as Muslims or Christians by the FDS. So our results are strange because even with the noisy signal, the results are still strong. Uh, uh, th they didn't really know who was Muslim or Christian, and yet they acted towards the Muslims as if they knew it. And how they knew it is something that we still haven't deciphered. The principal treatment was the number of targeted religious outgroup in the session as dictators. I'll get to that in a minute. So for the playing of the dictator game, think of a large screen here and think of each of you as one of the 10 players. You know five of them very well. You've met them for four minutes. Uh, the others you can see by their first names and you're sitting in a room with them. And a set of pictures, six pictures goes across the screen. You're given, each person is given five euros for each picture and told you can keep all five for yourself. You can give one, two, three, four, or five to the person on the screen. And then they would write down for each person how much they want to give. They would keep what they kept for themselves, and what they decided to give would be delivered to the person whose picture was taken. And the idea was, you're under a kind of social pressure here, <laughs> because even though you have a private clipboard, you know that there are other people around you looking at you. And we tried to build in that social pressure feeling of not doing the dictator game alone, but in this sort of social group. So if you can see here, the way we got sufficient controls is we had six, ah, we had, I feel like Charlie Brown, I can't, we had six photos. No, I can't do this. Uh, and two of them were clearly uh, Francais de Souche, Sylvie and Jean-Marc. Two of them were our Senegalese plants. One is Khadija for half the people who played, but she was Josephine for the other half. So we were able to see whether they, they treated her differently in her Muslim guise as opposed to her Christian guys. And then the other Senegalese plant was Michel or Abu Bakr. And, and when, Khadi, when Khadija was Khadija, uh, the other Senegalese uh, uh, confederate was Michel. When she was Josephine, he was Abu Bakr. And then we had two people who had ambiguous, uh, uh, you could say, prototypes. Uh, one was Georges, and we called him Mohammed. <laughs> And, and Christine, whom we called for half the people um, uh, Farida. So we could see how half the people who saw, say, Khadija as Khadija compared to the other half who saw her as Josephine. So we were able to get controls. We couldn't say it's a particular face which was, uh, which was more attractive uh, than another. So what we were able to do, if I can get this correct, is if you look at table three, I must have some. So if you look at table three, sorry about this. If you look at table three toward the fractal analysis, you can see that the eight sessions, that one, that, uh, that uh, five sessions had only one SX. That's the second column down. Five sessions had only one SX. But two of them had one SM, two of them had two SMs, and one of them had three SMs. So we were able to look to see whether the FDS were more generous to Muslims when there's one SM in the room or compared to two, and whether they were more generous to Muslims when there are two SMs in the room compared to three. So the more Muslims in the room, would they become less generous towards, uh, towards Muslims with the same number of SX in the room. Similarly, we can go in the other direction and say, with uh, two 
Muslims in the room. That's the second column down. We've got two sessions with one SX and two sessions with two SX. Would we be able to find that with increasing number of uh, SXs in the room, holding SM constant at two, would you find less generosity towards SXs? So we're able to measure each additional SM in the room holding SX constant and each additional SX in the room holding SM constant to see if we can see if there is a generosity effect with increasing numbers of, uh, increasing number of Muslims or increasing number of, uh, uh, of Christians. The principal result, the Ortefeu effect is confirmed. As I will only go through a couple of these, um, these tables, given the nature of the, um, uh, the, uh, the video here, consistent significant lowering of FDS generosity to SM with increasing number of SM holding SX constant. No such result with increasing number of SX holding SM constant. And this is confirmed with a bunch of regressions uh, that I will try to spare you uh, from. Uh, so let me see if I can go through table four, which gets you, gives you a sense of what we're doing. So what we're looking at, if you look at the top uh, right box, FDS dictators donation. That's what we're looking at. The dictators are these guys in the room who are deciding whether to give or not give to these people we call confederates. And we see the average donation the average donation uh, uh, with increasing number of Muslims. Uh, uh, with one Muslim, it's two, two euros and six centimes. With two uh, Muslims, it's uh, one euro and three centimes, which goes down. But with three Muslims, it goes back up to one euro and 83 uh, centimes. There's no clear uh, pattern here. There's no, compare, there's no clear pattern in the second row, donations to FDS. No clear pattern with donations to North Africans. No clear pattern with donation to SX. But in the next to last line, donation to SM, two euros 83 centimes with one SM in the room, one euro 60 centimes with two SM in the room, and 75 centimes with three uh, uh, SM in the room. That's donations to Khadija when she's <laughs> when she's uh, 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 Hadija and Abu Bakr when he's Abu Bakr, compared to giving to um, Josephine when she's Josephine and Michelle when he's uh, Michelle. I could go down and show you that it's the same when you hold uh, SX equal to two. This goes the same way. And nothing happens when we increase the number of SXs. I could show that as well. And then to make things almost incomprehensible. But I can tell you what we did here in a fairly clear way in table eight. People say, well, maybe it's not really whether they're Muslims or Christians. Maybe the Christians are richer than the Muslims. Or maybe um, it's the gender, uh, it's the gender of the Muslims and there are more women Muslims. Or maybe it's uh, the degree to which they're religious. Uh, all sorts of other extraneous factors may be driving this. And so what we do in a regression analysis is those, all those last lines is we add controls to see whether if we uh, controlled for, let's say, the income of the family, the religiosity of the subject, uh, the results would change. And what we do, here in the bottom, it's called a walled test. We say, compare all the cases where there's an increase in the number of Muslims um, uh, holding SX constant to all increases in Christians holding um, SM constant. Compare those two results. Are those results significantly different? And with a probability of zero, we can, uh, we can uh, reject the null hypothesis consistently. Uh, the statistical relationship shows that, the, that increasing the number of Muslims leads to lower French generosity to mu Muslims than increasing the number of Christians, leading to a lower uh, 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 donation to Christians. In fact, 
in most cases, the donations to the Christians go up. I'm positive with more Christians and negative with more Muslims. So this is the principal result uh, that we find. Ah, I didn't want to do that. Bad move. Um, So I'm going to take you through two rather quickly without showing you the statistical results. Maybe it's the fault or the beliefs of the FDS, the beliefs of the FDS about Muslim behavior. Maybe they're reacting to Muslim behavior. For example, the Francais de Souche could think, and many Francais de Souche say this could be uh, the case, that when there are more Muslims around, Muslims get a sense of group solidarity and know they can act aggressively towards French people, be more aggressive because we have safety in numbers. So maybe it's the case that when the more Muslims around, the French believe they're going to be treated worse. And if they're going to be treated worse, they will treat the Muslims worse. We call that in this business tit for tat. So what we looked at is, do the Muslims, when there are an increasing number of Muslims in the room, do the Muslims actually give less to the Francais de Souche? Answer is no. So if the French believe that, they're false beliefs. So we can reject the, uh, the tit-for-tat mechanism. I won't show you the statistics on that. The second one is what we call free riding. Suppose the French believe that with more Muslims around, they take care of themselves. They give each other all the support they need. And if there's, a, if there's a Abu Bakr or a, uh, on the screen, and there are a number of Muslims in the room, and all the Muslims are going to give him all five of the euros, the French could say, screw it. I'll just keep all of myself. He's going to get enough from the other Muslims. That's free riding on the generosity of the other Muslims. So what we did is examine uh, whether the French believe, whether the French believe that the Muslims give more to their own than the Christians. And that's part of the strategic dictator game that I'll get into more clearly later. We asked them what they think a player called Ahmed gave to the, uh, uh, gave to uh, the Confederate Abu Bakr. Is it any different from the exact same face, call him Jean Bernard, <laughs> gave to, um, uh, gave to uh, the, um, uh, the Christians? It turns out the French do not believe that the Muslims are more generous to each other than the Christians are to each other. So, the, so you can't explain the difference in the way they behave to the SM versus the XX by beliefs about free riding, because the French do not believe there's any difference between the way Muslims and Christians would act towards their own. So this was a, a picture of the strategic dictator game to give you a sense of what we did. We asked them, Ahmed uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was the model. He was a Senegalese dictator of uh, the first set of experiments we ran in 2009. And here he is in the Muslim guise. And we asked the Francais de Souche, 50 of them over a course of a couple of weeks, how much do we think Ahmed gave to each of these? Here it's Khadija versus Michel. The next one it's, uh, it's uh, Josephine and, uh, and Abu Bakr. And it turns out Ahmed is seen to be given no more to Khadija compared to Michel than if his face were called Jean Bernard, that he would give uh, more to Michel than uh, uh, to uh, Khadija. So there was no difference uh, in the way the Francais de Souche thought Muslims uh, were solidarity, had solidarity with each other more so than a comparable set or match set of Christians. Therefore, disconfirming the free riding explanation. So we got to think, and we have some additional data to support this. Without this rational foundation of beliefs, beliefs about how 
the SM uh, uh, will be aggressive or SM will be, free, will be super supportive of each other, we infer that the FDS experience a kind of a cultural threat with increasing number of Muslims that's not felt with Christians. And this taste-based feeling is a manifestation of the Ortefeu effect. And we call this Ortefeu convention, and I'm going to describe what I mean by convention, uh, because it comes from some really interesting work by an economist, Robert Sugden. So he did a little examination of his home beach area in Yorkshire. And what he learned was every morning driftwood comes up on the Yorkshire beach, which is very useful for heating homes. Who owns this driftwood? Who has property rights to it? Well, in Yorkshire, there's a very clear set of, you can call them rules, that she or he who collects it first and puts it into a pile, once it's in a pile, it belongs to that person. And they can come three days later, five days later, a month later, no one will touch it. Everyone knows that that's what Yorkshire people do. And Sugden says, and if it's, if it's loose on the beach, you can start your own pile. And Sugden says there are scores of different ways that you can organize property rights for driftwood. None of them is more efficient than the other. But once a convention establishes, people think of it as morally correct. And they think of it as obvious and are amazed that foreigners wouldn't do the same thing. We have these conventions in America. They're so, they're so conventional, we don't even know we have them. The example I like to give, because uh, uh, I lived in Chicago for 12 years, uh, is uh, shoveling, um, uh, your front, uh, sh shoveling your front uh, uh, walkway uh, or sidewalk after a snow storm. Now, if a neighbor comes and shovels it for you early in the morning, you're not allowed to give him $10. We know you can't give your next door neighbor $10 or $20 for doing this. But if, you were, if it were the neighbor's son, there's no problem. We just know this. I don't know how we know it. Uh, but one would be considered odd. Now, if you really want to thank your neighbor, the next snowstorm, you get up at 5 in the morning and clear his real quickly, or you buy a bottle of scotch or wine and put it in the front, put it in the front stoop. But we know as a convention that it's not, we don't do that. And it's kind of morally, we, we put it in moral language. We say this person doesn't understand friendship uh, if they try to give us $10. So it has an obviousness that we don't even think about. And what Jan Elster, uh, the, uh, the philosopher, says, we do it because it has a grip on the mind, not because we've calculated our friendship rules. We, we just know that that's wrong, uh, and we, we steer away from it. It's not based on beliefs, but based on feelings. And so we did, in the strategic dictator game, we got a sense of what a French convention is like. What we did, and it's the only time I think we really lied to our subjects. Uh, after they played the dictator game, the ten, the ten, uh, sorry, the six people for which they gave money, we said, now we're going to do something new. We're going to take out of this hat a number, one of the player numbers, at random, and this person is going to become the model. That was a lie. All of them was A4, and A4 was always a Francais de Souche in the group. So we chose a Francais de Souche model. The, we say A4, A4 stands up and he looks to everyone not like Entre les Murs, he looks like Francais de Souche. And, and then we say, we're going to go through these six pictures. And your job is to guess how much this model gave to each of these six pictures. Well, you guess how much each one, and the one who comes closest to what a4 actually gave, will come home with an extra 40 euros, which was then about $60, your taxpayer money. So that's the way we played the game. And this was to measure the degree to which FDS expected the model to give less to SM Confederates, the more there were SM in the room compared to SX. And I ought to go here to just show you this, even though it's going to look obscure.
But here, the dependent variable is the FDS guesses about FDS donations. That is, FDS are making guesses about the model's donations. And we have here whether there is an increasing number of uh, Senegalese Muslims in the room compared to an increasing number of Christians in the room. And what we find, if you look at this thing called p-value of the wall test at the very end, that consistently they guess, the, they guess that the model has given significantly less to the Muslim guises than to the Christian guises the more Muslims there are in the room. So they were paying for real money, and their guesses were that, uh, that other FDS, uh, that the FDS believed that other FDS would act in a discriminatory way with more Muslims in the room. So I'm almost finished. So in conclusion, Relying on a set of linked game protocols to identify the channels through which discrimination is sustained, players who are rooted French exhibit less generosity towards Muslims as the number of the Muslims in the room increases. We further find that two possible rational models to explain this result, tit for tat and free riding, are not supported by our experimental data. We infer from these findings that the rooted French practice, that the rooted French, FDS, practice discrimination against Muslims, which is not due to rationally based updated beliefs about Muslim social behavior, but rather due to a distaste or a sense of threat in being surrounded by many Muslims. Rooted French believe other rooted French will act similarly, and thus this discrimination becomes conventional, such that the Minister of Interior a former Minister of Interior, could refer to it in a rather self-assured and unreflective manner. Thank you. I'm looking, open for questions. Yeah? Religiously, oh, sure, yeah, who have a closer relationship re religiously with Christian people than the Muslims would. Yeah, uh, doing this, doing this for, uh, for Jewish discrimination would be really exciting. The problem I would face, so I can't really answer your question, is how do you find a comparable group <laughs> of subjects who are like these Jews in every respect, but they're not Jewish. Um, <laughs> so the, there would be a very difficult measurement strategy. You might be able to do this with, say, and I would like to do it, say in Israel today, 40% of the migrants from the Soviet Union to Israel in the late 1980s, early 1990s claimed to be Jewish. Uh, uh, so all of them claimed to be Jewish, uh, but in fact, 40% of them were not. And what, what I would love to be able to do in Israel, or you go, we can't do it in France, is to examine the degree to which, uh, the degree to which being Jewish helps you, uh, even though, even though both groups are called uh, called Russians. So the degree to which you can replicate this requires a very, what we call this an identification strategy, finding two groups which are alike in every respect, but, uh, but, which, but which you can identify by one difference. But going back to France for a minute, there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, that religion in France is something that no one talks about and everyone feels. Uh, and the uh, affair of Dreyfus uh, of the uh, 19th century uh, uh, showed a French shame uh, in the discrimination and uh, discrimination against Jews. Uh, uh, the shame still persists in such a way that I was living in uh, for a year in the street where the most or orthodox Jews of uh, Paris lived. And I don't know if you know Paris, but Rue de Rosier. Uh, and 
for all Jewish holidays, it seemed like half of the French gendarmerie was there protecting the synagogues for fear that their own people would do something that would humiliate them. So I think they're scared of their own, um, their own religious discrimination, and it may reflect anti-Jewishness, but my methods won't allow me to really measure that. You want to speak to just this point, Irene? Yeah, I want to, I want to ask a similar question with that, because I'm glad this question of Jewishness has been brought up. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the historical specificity of this study, because as you're talking and as you're talking about all these variables, I can't help but wonder if you substitute Muslim with any outgroup in French history, you would have gotten the same results at any point in time. If you substitute Jewish in 19, post-Dreyfus, pre-Dreyfus, um, any time in, in the Third Republic, you would see a lot of the same themes, acting clannish, um, not being truly Republican, um, fear of, of halal versus kosher slaughtering. You see a lot of this, and I, I, I just wonder, um, I guess I just felt that your talk was stripped a little bit of this, of this specificity that I think is so important to French history and to French culture. You're not dealing with the German case for any number of reasons. You throw colonialism into the mix, you separate out which were French colonies versus which weren't French colonies, and you have an even more complex matter. So I was just wondering if maybe you could speak to the specificity of this study a little bit more. I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> the extent to which there's a beauty to this, to this experimental setup, it is that we've controlled for colonial effect because we're not seeing this with Senegalese Christians. So we could say that, <laughs> in a sense, that Senegalese Christians were also colonized people. And, well, just hold up for a second. So, uh, I, if you want to say that all groups who were subject to uh, French colonialism are despised for being different, what, I've, what I'm showing is that two groups which had the same colonial experience, uh, th there was a clear, m clear, difference between the way the French had dealt with Africans who are Muslims and Africans who are Christians. So I could say that the colonial effect was controlled for. Um, now, the, the, okay, so, uh, yes, so you could say, you could say, if you want, that the, um, that the situation of the North Africans, because of the notion of uh, Algérie Française and the, and, the, and the trauma of losing it, uh, added to the effect, added to the effect of anger. In that case, my study shows the, shows the, uh, the lower bound of the effect. And when I gave this talk to historians before I actually did the research, historians said to me, oh, but you'll never find anything uh, from this because, uh, because Senegalese are not thought of as Muslims or Christians, they're just thought of as Africans. You'll only find the effect if you go to Algeria. So I said, okay, we're gonna find the lower bound of the effect. And the lower bound of the effect is pretty significant. So I can't make claims about how much bigger the effect would be for Algerians. But I can say that we found a religious effect uh, uh, of French discrimination uh, that is at least the lower bound of what, it, uh, of, of what it might, the full effect might be. And I think that's a reasonably important finding. Um, thanks. Um, the, the obvious corollary to these kind of questions about it, extending and looking elsewhere would be, I'm wondering whether you've thought about now that you've found this cultural phenomena that is French, whether in actual fact you can show that it's French or whether it's Western European. So if you repeated exactly the same experiments you did here, but in Britain, and you substituted in a suitable divided Southeast Asian population that has both Christian and Muslim members, would you get the same result? Is this a French problem or French condition? 
here's, I, I'm delighted you asked this question. Here's the way I'm thinking about this, that what, for the two years I've been in France, until David Cameron's speech of two weeks ago, uh, there was calumny heaped across the English Channel every single day that the British would say uh, to, the, uh, to the French, because of your make-believe republicanism, the, all the Muslims in the world hate us. You're forcing these people to assimilate and they don't want to assimilate, and the hatred is building. And then the calumny was heaped in the other direction and saying, you guys in Lundestan are permitting uh, Pakistanis to import 14-year-old uh, uh, wives. Uh, they never learn any English, and they're incarcerated in the homes of their husbands. Uh, and that's going to lead to um, that's going to lead to Salafism taking over all of Europe. The amazing thing about this calumny uh, is that no data support no no data support either side. And and my longer-term goal is to do the following, and addresses your question. I want to think. If you think of a matrix and think of the y-axis as a differential effect, even if it's lower bound effect, the differential effect of being a Muslim compared to what everything about you that was saying, uh, but not Muslim, and put that as a value on the y-axis. On the x-axis, instead of putting country names, which I wouldn't want to do, I would put country policy or, uh, orientations from multiculturalism to republicanism. And ask the question, uh, is there any relationship to the policies of the European states and the degree to which there's discrimination. And you could take, it would be very hard to do this for South Asians because you can't find a comparable group of Christians compared to, say, Pakistani Muslims. But you could, because I've worked on this group before, find a large group of Yorubas who are 40% Christian and 40% Muslim uh, and with a very large presence in UK and look to see whether Muslimness uh, uh, leads to different, uh, to different outcomes in a similar way as Muslimness did in the controlled setting in France. And begin to look as you go across a scale, the degree to which there's multicultural rules, the, whether in fact there is a higher degree of discrimination or a lower degree. And the amazing thing is we don't know the answer to that. And so all the debates in Europe about what would be the better policy, including David Cameron's speech two weeks ago, based upon no information whatsoever, uh, would in a sense be subject to some kind of analytic rigor. Sorry. Next. Thanks. Uh, I'm interested in the, the, the extent to which this Hortifo effect that you found is, is universal in the, the French population that you're looking at. Uh, I'm interested first off in whether or not um, there are sort of education effects here. Maybe less educated people are more likely to exhibit these kinds of attitudes or, or not. I don't know. But I'm also interested in whether you find the same effect among, say, Senegalese Christians and their attitudes towards Senegalese Muslims. So the first one is, uh, we made, when we first did the experiments, we made an inferential error, which we had to correct in reference to your, uh, uh, to your first question. And that was, we said, doing this in the 19th arrondissement, we're taking the French population that's most accustomed to hanging around outsiders. And therefore, therefore again, th we'd be underestimating the effect even if we found one, because we're, we're finding French people who are used to being around Muslims. And then it occurred to us that that's ridiculous. That there are two reasons why Francais de Souche are in the 19th or any smart, you could say. One is because they like being around others and they like cosmopolitanism. And two, because they bought their apartments uh, uh, 40 years ago, uh, the apartments uh, were cheap, they were rent controlled, uh, and they can't get out and they can't stand the fact that they have all these Muslims around them. Uh, so it could be the one of the two. So what we did for the second set of experiments is we asked all the Francais de Souche, uh, uh, who all lived in the 19th, what arrondissement would they live in if they could live anywhere in Paris? <laughs> And we're still analyzing those data. So we want to see whether, in fact, uh, changing the Francais de Souche, uh, uh, how general it is amongst the Francais de Souche. Uh, the, your second question is terrific, and I'm going to start uh, working on an answer, but I can't give you an answer now. I, we, I never looked at how 
We know a good deal, we have a lot of data on how the SXs treated the SMs and vice versa, but I haven't analyzed them. It's a great question. Um, I don't know whether this is pertinent or not, but I'll ask anyway. Um, why such passions over the headscarf? Who cares whether a Muslim or a non-Muslim uh, wears a headscarf or not? This is an extremely pertinent question. Uh, there's a great book uh, by an American anthropologist, John Bowen, called Why the French Hate Headscarves. But rather than give you his thesis, I'll, I'll give it in a more personal way. I gave a talk sort of like this uh, in, a, in, a, in one of these, uh, they're known in, in France as ZEP, CEPs, uh, Zones of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of Economic Precariousness, uh, uh, where they're trying to do some affirmative action kind of policies. And I gave a talk on, uh, on, um, on treatment of Muslims in, uh, in Europe. And uh, afterwards, three or four women who are my age came up to me and said, you don't understand the situation in France at all, uh, uh, that making any accommodation on the headscarf issue uh, will undermine everything we've worked for for 40 years uh, uh, to, to bring about equality between the genders. Uh, that this would be an admission, uh, if we allow this, that we're accepting the incarceration or the sub subservience of women to their own men. And unless, if we allow Muslims who can do this to their own women, if we allow them to have, um, uh, uh, to have a voice and an effect on our policy, we will have, we will have lost uh, the, uh, the work we've done for the last 30 years. So I would say that in a short, the answer to your question is m most most uh, French who are active on this, who have been most active in trying to block the hijab or the foulard, are, are uh, people who've worked on the front lines to bring about gender equality in Europe and see this as a threat. And on average, but not strongly, but on average, Muslim respondents are less accepting of gender equality than non-Muslims. So the women see the foulard issue as one which is undermining something important that they have won politically in the past generation. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.